My dudes, what is up? Welcome to my tiny house and welcome to my channel. My name is Stacy. I make videos about all things related to tiny houses. During the summer, I participated in, I attended the tiny home show in Ancaster. The show was run by my friend Maria, Tiny Homes in Canada, and my dearly beloved uh, Bianca of the Giving Tree family. So shout out to both of them for putting in so much hard work to bring the tiny community together. I wanna say in Ontario, but we had builders from BC, from Alberta. Uh, it was so cool to meet Jen from Teacup Tiny Homes in real life because we had been chatting a lot on social media. It was really cool to meet a lot of uh, tiny home dwellers in person and to see the appetite for this movement, man, it was really, really cool to see everyone come out, see the tiny houses in person, tour them. It's so cool to see uh, how many people were enthusiastic and who want to live this lifestyle. So another thing that I participated in during the show was a Q&A panel. Uh, we had folks who live in tiny homes ourselves. So Bianca was on this panel, Darcy from Acorn Tiny Homes. So he's a builder and Rebecca, her partner is the founder of Instead Works, which is another uh, tiny home builder based in Toronto. It was really cool to hear people's questions about what it's like for us who live in tiny homes particularly everyone else in the panel except for me, raising children in their tiny homes. We got a lot of questions during that panel, but in anticipation of the show, the Tiny Home Show Instagram account made a post asking people, if you have any questions for the Living Tiny Q&A panel, leave them in the comments down below. And people left such amazing questions and I wanted to make this video answering those questions. So. Let's, let's get into it. Let's answer some of your questions. So the first question that I really love is that what are some ways that tiny home living can be made more accessible for folks with disabilities, i.e. ADA compliant? I'm sure a lot of you don't know this about me, but for the majority of my career, I was building websites with the specialty of accessibility. So in Canada, we have the AO, or in Ontario, we have the AODA, which is the Access for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. That affects physical infrastructure, like a home, like sidewalks, public transit, but also like in my case, how people access information online. However, again, I don't build homes. <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of folks, when they think disability, they think, okay, someone who's on a wheelchair, Maybe someone who has, you know, some other physical disability. Something that the women on the Q&A panel talked about is like when they were pregnant, like how are they going to climb up the ladder into their loft? You can 100% make a main floor bedroom in a tiny house. In fact, a lot of folks do. A bed in a loft is just one option and it's a great use of vertical space, but it's certainly not a necessity. How are you going to get into the house? The house has to be propped up. Uh, at a certain level. So you are gonna need a ramp in order to access the front door. I guess like the width or the space that, you know, can it accommodate my wheelchair, for example, is something that a builder can absolutely keep in mind. But the Ontario building code requires a lot of those things anyways. So if you're building to code, it's gonna, those things are just kind of built in, they're a given. Maybe they would need, you know, some supports to be able to use the toilet, like a little bar um, on the wall, but I have room for that too, so that wouldn't be a problem. But, you know, physical disabilities are only one category. So, you know, for someone who is deaf, they would probably want a strobe light effect on their carbon monoxide detector. I, th I think the answer is 100% yes, you can. It might just not look like all of the tiny houses that you see online that are built for able-bodied people. And you don't see a lot of visibility of people with disabilities in this community, but they're out there and they exist. And I'll put some links and videos down below to really cool, accessibly built tiny homes. 
So this next question, um, there's actually a few questions that are similar. So I'll talk about it all at once. This one is by Michelle LC. What financing is available for purchasing a tiny home? Nick Settle asks, what financing options are available for those interested in purchasing a tiny home? Raising Ryan and Kai, would a grant program be available to assist with the building and or purchase? And then she also asked, is there some sort of environmental financing program for a tiny home due to the benefits it has being smaller slash less of an eco footprint than a regular home? I have addressed these topics. One is the grants, rebates that you do not qualify for being in a tiny home. And that is because, this is like the answer to all of the questions, a tiny house, that's not really a term that is a legal term. It's a term that we use casually in conversation, but it is zoned as a secondary or accessory dwelling unit, which means that it is not your legal home, right? I cannot list this as my legal address on my driver's license. I have to tell the government that I live somewhere else, even though I don't. And it's such bull The government thinks that this is my cottage. This is my seasonal home. Those, you know, new homeowners rebates, those like greener homes grants, you're not eligible for them. And I have a couple of videos that I'll shout out here. So one that was a really great video that I did in collab with Let's Go Tiny, Destiny and Brianna, who live in their tiny house in Portland, Oregon. And we talk all about the finances of living in a tiny house because a tiny home is not uh, your primary home. We can't apply for a mortgage. So you have to find some other kind of loan structure that works for you. It could be a line of credit. It could be a chattel loan, which is something that you would use for like a boat or an RV. If you're going through a builder, they might provide a financing model for you. We took out a $45,000 loan from- a personal loan. Personal loan, yeah. From a company called Lightstream. Lightstream, yeah. Um, we heard about them on YouTube, at all the thousands of tiny house videos. So we went with them. Initially, we kept hearing about SoFi. SOFI yeah. was like a very popular tiny house loan and people were talking about how they got like 50 to a hundred thousand dollars approved and we got like five thousand dollars approved from them so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when like I started breaking down I was like we're never gonna get a loan like what the hell but I really want this government to realize that oh this is a sustainable more eco-friendly more affordable most importantly to me form of living for a lot of folks who don't have access, who will never have access to buying their own home. I wanted to own my own home and I couldn't afford anything else. <laughs> That's just what it comes down to. So I, I really recommend that you watch that video because we're very real and honest about that. And I think it's great to hear from other uh, people's perspectives, not just mine. So definitely check that video out. The next question, this comes from long and lean legs. <laughs> Quite the handle. Ontario. Are tiny homes able to meet insulation requirements for negative 30 to plus 30 degree weather? Yes, and way better than old traditional homes and way better than apartment buildings. Where I used to live, my apartment building was built in the 1960s. Always cold in the winter. I was always boiling hot in the summer. And this house is so much more comfortable. I have spray foam insulation. It is like the highest R value that's available on the market. Definitely, it will put you through all of the extremes that we experience in this province because we get the hot, we get the cold. <laughs> and yeah, my house has been extremely comfortable. So uh, thank you for that question. Next is Rachel in the real life. Other than BC and Ontario, are other provinces on board with the legalization of tiny homes? So I'm sorry, Rachel, but I'm going to tell you that the premise of your question is incorrect. The allowance of tiny homes is not done on the provincial level. It's done on the municipal level. So if Toronto was down for legalizing tiny homes, Mississauga might not be. And, and they're right on the border of each other. And I'm using that example. I would say Ontario is not down for legalizing tiny houses because the majority of municipalities are not down for it. They will come up with all sorts of excuses. 
they don't want to change the character of their neighborhood by having these these little houses everywhere you're gonna increase the density it's gonna be like a cancer well I guess I just get really frustrated because I'm seeing municipalities over and over again make their decisions based on what the already well-off landowners want and not caring about giving more options for affordable housing to people who are desperate and are gonna be homeless if they aren't given more options the haves and the have-nots and keeping them separate and also like keeping them fighting over each other because the problem is not the landowners it's the politicians who are not giving them the option to rent out their backyard because it's actually a means of income for those landowners and a lot of them I'm sure would love to have a couple living in their backyard to help them pay the mortgage it actually benefits everybody <laughs> definitely I would say like follow my friend Bianca at the Giving Tree family she is working with a lot of municipalities she talked about this at the tiny home show too to advance the legalization of tiny homes but so much work still needs to be done and it's really really slow and really frustrating all right so the next question is by katie Overmonds, and she asks what are the three most important things for a brand newbie to consider when in the process of evaluating whether or not to dive into the world of a tiny home i'm gonna try to answer your question in a way that will provide some value to you Sit down everybody who's going to be living in this house together at the table and talk about what things are important to you. What do you need space for? What do you not need space for? Even something as simple as, you know, I used to have a living room and an office. And in my living room I had a TV. And in my office I had a computer. And I was like, what if I just got a really big computer monitor and then put my couch on the opposite side so now I don't need a TV because my computer monitor is big enough that it can also be my TV. There you go. Now I just eliminated the need for a whole extra room because I just put them together. A lot of folks don't have a full size oven in their kitchen because they're like, well, I don't really cook that much. And maybe just a two stovetop burner is good enough for me. Maybe just an air fryer and a microwave and a toaster oven is good enough for me and I don't need an oven. Technology is really cool these days. <laughs> and like, you don't need a stacked washer and dryer because they have one machine that can do both. So there are a lot of appliances that you can look at that will eliminate a lot of the space that you might have had in a different size home that will allow you to live just as functionally and comfortably without the space that those things are occupying. One thing that would really, really help is to go stay in a tiny house. Find one on Airbnb, stay in it for, you know, three days, maybe a week, and just feel it out. That can also help you determine what kind of layout is going to work for you. And yeah, I think that will be really helpful for you in terms of your decision making. So hopefully those were <laughs> good tips. Raising Ryan and Kai, yet again. What permits are required to start the process of building a tiny home? I could talk about this for like hours. There are some other videos that I've talked about that might be helpful resources for you. If you're building a house in Canada, it needs to be CSA certified. So an inspector would have to come and inspect the house and make sure that it's all built to code. If you're a tiny home builder, that's a certification that you need to buy ahead of time in order to build the structure. And then you need to work with wherever you're gonna park it, their planning division to figure out can I park it on this land? What is the permitted uses of this land? It's a really big can of worms that you just opened up <laughs> asking that question. And I wish I could say that it's like an easy path. One thing I will mention, if you are interested in leasing someone else's land and parking a tiny home on that land, or if you are a landowner and you're interested in allowing people to park on your land, but you want to do it legally, my dear friend, again, Bianca from The Giving Tree, has a membership program and I'm not like trying to shill and like I'm being honest like you need a roadmap you need a path that will guide you on how to do this because it is so complex and it's really impossible to do it on your own so I'm gonna put a link in the description down below for that as well okay and that is all of the questions guys I love those questions I hope you learned something if you found any information in this video valuable, please share it with a friend. I would really appreciate it. And if you have any other questions, leave them in the comments down below. Maybe I'll do a Q&A part two. And that's all for now, folks. Take it easy.